Let's go to the Lord in prayer for this message. Father, thank you for calling the prophet Jonah a reluctant prophet, much like we're reluctant at times. God, running from you like we ran from you, Lord. Thank you that in your love and providence and mercy, not only did you save Jonah, but you saved many. Father, uh, I pray that the gospel's heard through today's message and also that the church is encouraged with the gospel, reminded of the gospel. Lord, as we turn uh, to this great book, pray that you open our hearts and minds with understanding from the Spirit. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So today, as we, we, as we begin our study in the book of Jonah, we're going to spend some weeks in this incredible experiential book of prophecy. It's experiential. It's different. Jonah's account is quite different than the other prophets in the Old Testament in two key ways. The first and most striking is the emphasis on the writing, different than the other prophets, is that it's on Jonah's relationship to God and God working in the life of Jonah for the sake of a people. Very little prophecy is actually mentioned in the book. In fact, maybe a line. That's different than the prophets. Secondly, Nineveh does something quite strange. They quickly repent. That's very different than the other books of prophecy. They quickly repent and turn from their wickedness, at least for a season. And they seek God's forgiveness. In other prophetic accounts, we see God's people and other nations not obeying the word of the Lord. And judgment, severe judgment of the Lord comes upon those people. Now, we're, we're in a new book, so we always like to set some, some historical and other contexts. So let's do this, some historical and cultural context. Let's talk about the city, first of all. The ancient city of Nineveh was enormous uh, in scale, said to take three days to walk across. Nineveh. The first mention of the city Nineveh is found in Genesis chapter 10, verse 11. This passage ascribes the founding of Nineveh to Nimrod from the line of Cush. Now, Nimrod is Noah's great-grandson. So you would have had Noah, Ham, Cush, and Nimrod. All right. Jewish tradition from one of the ancient rabbinical writings, and it's there in your bulletin, you can look it up later, ascribes or says that the skins or coverings made by the Holy One, God Himself, were preserved by Noah in the ark. And that Ham gave these to Nimrod, the coats that God made for Adam and Eve, gave them to him as an inheritance. And I honestly have no idea if that's true or not. I thought, I mean, that's probably one of the coolest things I've read in a while from rabbinical tradition, okay? So I don't think we can say uh, decisively if that's true or not. It's not scripture. The city of Nineveh is located along the Tigris River, mentioned in the, in the Garden of Eden. Modern city of Mosul in Iraq, northern Iraq, central to the worship of an ancient fertility goddess, Ishtar. Mosul has been the scene of some of the bloodiest fighting in modern history. In the Persian Gulf, in the war in the Gulf, and then later during the resurgence when the, uh, when the uh, uh, Islamic extremists tried to retake the city, and they did for a time. Violence has been the calling card in this region pretty much throughout most of its existence. And that violence has risen up to heaven before God. Now around 663 B.C., a hundred years after Jonah, okay, so we got our story, which we'll get to, after Jonah, the prophet Nahum. Nahum was sent to foretell the fall of Nineveh again. Again, they embraced their cruelty and wickedness, and the city fell in 612 B.C. Here's how Nineveh is described at different periods in time through three of the minor prophets, Nahum, Jonah, and Zephaniah. It was called a bloody city. It was called great and extensive and rich, strong and a commercial center. It was populous, but it was also vile and wicked and idolatrous. It was full of joy and carelessness, full of lies and robbery, full of witchcraft. That's the city of Nineveh. 
Let's talk about some political background. King David began to reign somewhere around 1000 BC. And his son Solomon reigned from 970 to 830 BC. After him, we, we know from our study early this year that the kingdom was divided. We have Judah and Israel. All, and of course now, the first king of, of Israel is Jeroboam the first. Jeroboam. All 19 kings of Israel, every one of them did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Only a few in Judah did what was right. Imagine that, named Israel by God, and every, every one of them did evil in the eyes of the Lord. At the time of Jonah, Israel was ruled by the 13th king of Israel, Jeroboam II, who reigned from about 782 to 753 BC. Now the king of the Assyrian region, and Nineveh at the time of Jonah was either Shalmaneser III or Ashurna Serpil. And listen to how one of these kings wrote openly about his own cruelty. This is recorded in the Assyrian records. Listen to this. He said, in strife and conflict, I besieged and conquered the city, and I felled 3,000 of their fighting men with the sword. I captured many troops alive. I cut off some of their arms and hands. I cut off others, their noses, ears, and extremities. I gouged out the eyes of many troops. I made a pile of the living and a pile of their heads. I hung their heads on trees around the city. And that's exactly what this cruel king did. That's why Jonah was afraid. And apparently this was not an uncommon occurrence, depicted in the ancient Assyrian artwork. In the artwork itself from this period is the unashamed cruelty of the people of the region. It depicted men being forced to wrestle with lions, being eaten alive. Other artworks show men being skinned alive. This is in their artwork. I'm thinking a uh, little dark, huh? A little dark art there. Therefore God sent Jonah. God had sent Jonah. Let's talk about the prophet Jonah, and then we'll get into our teaching. Jonah is mentioned 28 times in the Bible, 18 times in the book of Jonah, that makes sense, five times in Matthew's gospel, and four mentioned in Luke's. However, the first mention of Jonah is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. It's talking about the reign of Jeroboam II, and it says of Jeroboam, he restored the border of Israel from Labo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, who was from gath Hefer. Now gath Hefer, Jonah's hometown, is about 110 miles, just pretty much north of Jerusalem. Let's turn now to this book of prophecy and take a look at Jonah 1. Thank you, Ken, for reading it. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2 right now. Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Here we see two commands that the Lord gave to Jonah. Arise and go. Arise and go. And he had one mission and one message to preach. He was to call out against the great city because of their extensive wickedness that had been seen and risen up before the Lord. Now we've already learned some of the aspects of their cruelty. I give you examples of that. Cities today around the world are multifaceted. Really no one word can describe a whole city, but indeed Nineveh was known for this cruelty. When people would say, what's Nineveh like? They'd say, it's a cruel place. It was indeed a difficult assignment, if you think about it, given to Jonah. Think about this in modern missionary terms. If you were to go on a mission to Jamaica, which Anna Joy and I have gone on a mission to Jamaica, or you were given the choice to go to Mosul, Iraq, which is where Nineveh is from, right? Same place. Which one would you choose? Which one would you want to go to? Like Jamaica or Mosul, Iraq? And, and what if you had to bring your kids? Which one would you choose? I know where I'd go to Jamaica. You know, that's where I'd go. <laughs> Yeah. What if God told you to go to Nigeria today, modern day Nigeria, preach to Boko Haram? This is a terror cell that's killed tens of thousands of people and it's part of Africa, displaced over two million people through their violence and cruelty. 
They're the ones who capture young girls and make them slaves, sexual slaves, and uh, young brides to Islamic men, sometimes two, three, four times their age. Imagine, God says, arise and go, Ken, to Boko Haram, because their bloodshed has come up before me. I'd get a lump in my throat. <laughs> That's what would happen to me. Preach against their wickedness. You see, God was sending his prophet Jonah to preach against the wickedness of Nineveh. And it's strange to me. I kind of wondered why, if they're so wicked, why didn't God just judge them and execute his justice on them? And I think the delay in such a thing with God reveals a bit of his character and the mercy of God. And I think as we study Jonah on a national level, we shouldn't think of ourselves as Jonah or the Hebrew people, but really on a national level, not on a personal level, but on a national level, we sometimes think here in America we're much better. But we really are more like the Ninevites than we'd like to think or admit, and I'll explain that to you right now. You see, here God was speaking to a nation under an Assyrian king, and it was indeed a wicked kingdom, full of lies, robbery, and witchcraft. Yet God sent his prophet, and that should begin to shake up our understanding of who we think God's going to show mercy to. God wants to show mercy to some cruel, cruel people. God judges entire nations and people, but he also made for himself a light unto the nations. He was sending the light of the message that he had through this prophet, this light bearer, Jonah, to a city that had 120,000 people living in it, according to Jonah 4.11. I should also point out that the evil of Nineveh was so great that it came up before the Lord. We need to understand what that means. God's not learning anything new here. Right? But it was just something that he tells us that we can relate to him, that none of this evil escapes God's notice. He knows the evil that's going on there, and he knows the evil that's going on in our nation today. God is not learning, per se, because God is all-knowing. God sees the evil in our nation, and I firmly believe this, that God has indeed sent a judgment upon our land, a strong delusion. And you may wonder, why are people thinking this crazy stuff? God has allowed it. He's given them over to the pursuits of their passions. That's why people engage in evil things and think nothing of it. Nothing of it. They have no fear of the Lord. Few seem to fear the Lord today, and many of these ones believe that they are indeed Christians. I see it so often. For all the horrors of Nineveh, skinning people alive and heads on poles, and there were many, they pale in comparison to the 65 million at least unborn children that's lives have been extinguished in our nation. There's nothing like this wickedness that has ever risen up to that magnitude in the world before this Roe v. Wade nonsense took our land. Do you suppose God that noticed Nineveh and their cruelty has somehow missed this great sin on our nation? Is not. God commanded Jonah to go and to make the journey. Go from gath his hometown, to Nineveh. Let's read in verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Now, the exact location of Tarshish isn't known today. There's a few guesses. Likely the southern coast of what is modern-day Spain. It's likely that, that area there. But more importantly, for Jonah, Tarshish is the farthest end of the world, the known world. And it's exactly in the opposite direction that the Lord is calling him to go. It's not unlike many of us before we come to know the Lord, going the exact opposite direction. Pushing back against God. Running from the Lord at every turn. This is what Jonah was doing. Going as far away from God as he could get. Jonah feared the Lord. And he feared the mission. Apparently he hadn't read King David's Psalm 139. Verse 7 through 10 reads this. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take 
the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand lay hold of me. See, see, David knew this. There was nowhere, absolutely nowhere, that he could go to be away from the presence of the Lord. Now last week we learned of the omnipotence of God. His omnipotence. This week we were reading of his omnipresence. There was literally nowhere Jonah could go to flee from the presence of God, Tarshish or otherwise. God is omnipotent, meaning he is perfectly powerful in every situation all the time. God is also omniscient, meaning that he is all-knowing and does not learn. And because his power and his wisdom are on display throughout all the world, we know this, that God is present, meaning God is indeed with us. He is here. Now the Son of God coming into the world bore the name Emmanuel. Matthew 1.23 teaches us this. It cites a prophecy in Isaiah 7.14. Behold, the virgin, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Oh, the omnipresence of God is wonderful for those who believe upon Christ, but it's terrifying to those who are running from the Lord. Now, Though Christ in his earthly body was not omnipresent in his earthly body, his Father in heaven was not at all bound in the ways that we are, and Christ only took upon a limitation in his humanity for a time, but he never laid aside his deity at all. This is important to understand as we work our way through Jonah, because God can be everywhere all the time and all-powerful and all-knowing. So if God is omnipresent, this is my first point to you today, he is not far from us. If God is omnipresent, he is never far from you. And we know that he is but a prayer away for us, for those who are in Christ. There's no need for us to run from God, though people do, or to hide from God. And I say this even to the lost, those who may be watching. Consider Adam and Eve in the garden. After they sinned, what did they do? They, they hid from God. But it was all a futile effort. We don't need to look far to see this trait still continuing on in humanity. You ever see a, a young one or a toddler get caught? They're doing something they shouldn't do. And they go, and sometimes they hide. They don't want to get caught, right? Or when they get older, they become something called this strange thing called a teenager. Instead of hiding, they, they just hide the evidence, okay? So they become more sneaky, right? And so they're able to hide the evidence. They cover up their tracks. But none of this escapes the notice of God. And none of it thwarts his will or adjusts it in any way ever for our lives. Imagine, there you are from New Orleans. Kelsey's from New Orleans and God says, go to Savannah, Kelsey. But instead, Kelsey gets on a plane and says, I'm booking it to Seattle. No, thank you. That's kind of a geology. Now, my friend Larry Anthony helped me with that geological example. That's about the same distance we're talking about here. New Orleans to Savannah and then over to Seattle. That's another point I think we should take from Jonah running away from God. Is this. When God directs your steps, don't fight it. Because you just might get thrown into the ocean and swallowed up. I wouldn't fight that. I'd quit fighting that. Don't push back against God. It, it, it's only, it, it could be worse. As we move through the rest of chapter 1, I want you to notice in your outline or in your bulletin, there's an outline I've given you. Now, it looks like this. I'm going to show, see that? You're going to need that as we work through this. A little technical. I'm going to show the folks this online, even though that document's not up. There's an outline. And there's a structure. There's a structure to, the, uh, to this writing. It's called a chiastic structure. And uh, while we don't need to know the fullness of that, it's a, it's a form of Hebrew writing that uses parallel verses that go to a central point. It drives to a central point and then away from it. All right? So it's called chiastic structure. In Jonah, it's a fascinating structure. You see that? Take a look at verses 4 and 5, and then we'll look at the parallel verses in 15 and 16. Verses 4 and 5. But the Lord, the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and he hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and had lain down and was fast asleep. 
Okay, thank you, Jonah. Um, let's take a look. You see, it was the Lord who drove the wind and the mighty tempest of the sea. Now, I've been out to sea when a typhoon was closing on our position. I've been out to sea in the Indian Ocean with 40-foot seas. And I'm going to tell you something. Even in a modern warship over 500 feet long, 505 by 66, threatens the life of that ship and the crew. That's a serious storm. Can you imagine being on an ancient vessel, an ancient wooden vessel, in 20, 30, or 40-foot seas? It would be terrifying. And it was the Lord who drove this to them. Of course, the mariners feared for their lives. All of us would fear for our lives in that situation. But what did they do to their, with their fear? The first part of verse 5 tells us they each cried out to their own gods. That's what they did. Now jump down to verses 15 and 16. This is our parallel chiastic structure. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows. Now the result of throwing Jonah overboard was this. It caused the storm to cease, and the men feared the Lord because they had seen and felt his power. Now look, here's the parallel, right? They feared the storm. Now they fear the Lord because they've seen his power indeed. And the result is they begin to worship God. Can you see that parallelism happening there? They feared the storm and now they fear the Lord. Let's watch how these thoughts progress in the middle of verse 5. Verse 5b. We see the sailors in their fear cry out to their own God. It says, each man cried out to his own God. Now look at verse 14. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. Let us not on and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So first they cried out to their own gods. Because of Jonah's testimony then and instruction to throw him into the sea, now they cry out to the one true God. And our parallelism continues and it will culminate at the main point that Jonah's getting at in this section. So we have seen the sailors go from fearing the storm to fearing the Lord. From crying out to their own gods to crying out to the one true gods. In this case, the name of Yahweh. That's who they cried out to. In the final part of verse 5c, the last part there, and the first part of 6, what we call 6a, we see the sailors attempt to save the ship by jettisoning some of the cargo. It said, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. I mean, there are some Jesus parallels going on here. But I think Jonah taking a nap while the sailors were fearing for their lives, he's taking a nap. And I guess this, the only thing I can figure for Jonah is, is he's at more peace there in the middle of this wicked storm than going to Nineveh or being in the presence of the Lord. That's how fearful Jonah was of God, that this was a break for him. But for the, for the sailors, the ship breaking apart, it was utter terror. But he was at peace with it. In verse 13, we see that their attempts to save the ships are futile. The ship, they can't save it. It says, nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. And Ken, you nailed that word earlier. It's a good job. <laughs> yeah, the tempestuous, right? I struggled with that a few times. None of their efforts, including throwing the cargo overboard, praying to their gods, or their powerful rowing, could change the will of God for Jonah and these mariners that were around him. None of that had an impact on God's will. Here we see the will of the Father on display, God's power. Anything God decrees will be seen through, and this is a lesson we're learning here. God could have killed Jonah and the sailors in an instant, but his word is done. Now doesn't Jesus teach us something about this in the Lord's Prayer? He said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is why we should never run from the Lord, though many of us do. It's not going to change the outcome that God has for you. We resist the calling of the Lord, but it finally proves to be too much for us. And he overtakes us, the love of his son. 
Isaiah 14, 26 and 27 speaks of the power of God's decrees. It said, this is the purpose that is purposed concerning the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out and who will turn it back? And the answer to that rhetorical question is no one. No one will turn back the hand of God. Not these sailors nor Jonah. Now in verse 6b, the second part there, we see the sailors ask Jonah for help. It says this, so the captain came to him and said, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise and call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Now, <coughs> after all, they'd been calling out to their own gods. And their ship was still being torn apart. In desperation, the captain wakes up Jonah and begs him, Cry out to your God. This is a desperate man. Cry out to a God they did not know. Here's the parallel. In verse 12, Jonah gave them instructions. He said, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. And that is the parallel thought. The men sought Jonah's help in verse 6. And in verse 12, Jonah tells them exactly what they need to do so that God will actually help them different than these other men's gods. No other effort would do. No other plan would suffice. So in verse 7, the sailors asked the cause of the deadly storm that has overtaken them. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and of course we know that it fell to Jonah. Now it was the Lord who revealed this to them. God allowed that. Look at the parallel verse in 11. Instead of asking the cause of their plight, they now ask Jonah the remedy of their plight. And we'll see why this is when we get to verse 9, which is the main point of all of this. They said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Now notice in your bulletins that structure of Jonah is building to that key central truth. We're almost there. Look at verse 8. The sailors asked Jonah, explaining, that you say, explain to us this evil storm. It's the who, the what, the why, the where and how. Where are you from? What God do you worship? They want to know it all. So they said to him, tell us on account, on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? Well, the parallel verse is found in verse 10. They ask him to explain himself again. Another explanation. It says this. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And here's, here's where we get to the main point, the, the point of all of this great part of this story. We get to the key truth of the passage and why God allowed Jonah to even board the ship in the first place. God was doing the work with Jonah, but he was also revealing himself to these pagan sailors who would come to know the one true God. And this should reveal something about the mercy of God. These men had nothing in them that was pleasing to God. Listen to, and look at Jonah's proclamation in verse 9. <coughs> And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. Can God get a witness? Yeah. He can get a witness through Jonah. Yes, he can. And he, and he made one out of Jonah. You notice that's not a big, long testimony, is it? It's not a big, long, planned out gospel presentation. Jonah says, God... I'm a Hebrew. I worship the one true God who created it all, the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> now these men up until this point were doing everything on their own power to save themselves. They cried out to their own gods who failed them. They had thrown their own cargo overboard. They cast lots. And then they strongly questioned Jonah. And even after Jonah witnesses Elohim to them, they tried to row with all their might in one last ditch effort and they did so in vain. They were doomed on their own power. Doomed. They were going to die. But Jonah had spoken of God in this case, and he uses the name Elohim. We heard this last week in a plural form. 
This is the form that is recorded in Genesis 1.1. Jonah, in every sense, is pointing to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Elohim created it all. These are the words he is uttering to these men. Jonah was basically telling these men that this Elohim is the God he serves and worships. And this God carries within himself the essence of majesty. And that the name alone stresses God's sovereignty and his incomparability. He is the God of gods. That's what he's telling these men. The creator of all things. And they feared. So in verse 14, the sailors, now desperate, having tried everything they could think of, to do on their own power and the power of their false gods finally say and cry out to God. It says, therefore, they called out to the Lord in verse 14. Therefore, they called out to the one true God, this Elohim. Well, let's talk about some application. That's, that's the whole narrative, okay, in a chiastic structure. All of those truths pointing, pointing, pointing ever tightly to this central truth that God created the heavens and the earth. The biblical account of Jonah the prophet is remarkable in every sense. We haven't even arrived at the giant fish part yet. Who's looking forward to the giant fish part? Any kids? I don't know. Yeah, I want to hear hear about the giant fish, right? Last week I spoke about the greatness of God revealed in Genesis. It was an important lesson for us to know rightly this God. And to understand what is going on in Jonah, we have to understand that that God can do these kind of things. And yes, even as we'll learn next week, send a great fish to swallow a man and keep him in his belly for three days without coming out eating up acid bones. That uh, that God can actually accomplish such a thing. In this short book of prophecy, we see imagery that all points to Christ. Three days in the belly. Right? The sacrifice over the side. Pointing to salvation being from God. The Lord himself claims this story in Matthew Matthew 12, 40. The Lord declared, For just as Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This, of course, speaks to the work of Christ on the cross and his death in the body. Our God writes narratives that are inconceivable, really, to think of by men. Yet they are truly the word of God. Where do we fit into the narrative, though? Are we Jonah? Are we the Ninevites? We have to consider that God is indeed dealing with the wickedness of a, na- of a city that's the size of a nation. So I hope our wickedness, personally, coming before God is not that of flaying people alive, skinning them alive. If it is, we'll have the ushers show you out and we can have a different discussion. I don't think any of us are doing that. But on a personal level, we are more like the mariners, the sailors in the boat, before we come to know the Lord. And I'm going to preach the gospel to you out of this. And I'm also going to preach the church shortly after that. You see, sadly, we often continue to live as the mariners. And I want to encourage us to take note of their lesson to us today. We reason like Jonah's mariners did. God begins to draw us to his son. That's what he does. But we push back. We're not saved yet. But the will of the Lord upon us can become unsettling to us. Sometimes we're not even certain what's happening to us. But the Lord is pressing in upon us. And it crushes us at times. We may not have cried out to other gods like the mariners did. But we complain to everybody under the sun that will listen to us. As we suffer and struggle. Our ship in this life is breaking apart. And so we devise a plan. And the God who created the heavens on earth and earth is nowhere in our plan. Just like the mariners, there's no one true God in their plan. There are only their fake gods and their own efforts and their own rowing. Nowhere is God in our plans before we come to know Christ. Instead of crying out to God, we complain and we complain. And then we get rid of some cargo and we make changes. We get some new friends. We paint our room. We take a trip. We'll do anything. We might even move to new geographic areas. Anywhere and anything we'll do just as long as it doesn't include God. Just as long as he's not in it. We're running from God. 
This is what the sailors were doing. This is what Jonah was doing. They relied upon their false gods, their own efforts, and finally their own might. But the pressing will of the Lord was upon him, and it comes upon us. All of our efforts were futile in the end, for we could not resist the will of the Lord once we came to Christ. The more and more we tried, the more exhausted we became in our lives. It's exhausting to fight against God. It's like the men rowing in the great tempest. They're they're exhausted. Quit fighting the Lord. Don't fight Him. Surrender. And do as the sailors did. They cried out to God. Cry out to Him. What other play do you have? Seriously. What other play do people have in the world but to cry out to God? Save me. These were professional sailors. Their captain was seasoned. He knew the wind and the currents during the season of the year that they were in. He knew that this tempest wasn't normal at all during that time of the year. And they knew that despite their best efforts, that they were indeed going to die. These were the pros who were on top of their game. And this reminds us that even the very brightest of minds today, the best, and the most powerful of human efforts cannot turn aside the will of the Lord, even a little bit. God wanted these sailors to know about himself, and God allowed Jonah to board that doomed ship. God could have prevented Jonah from ever getting on board the ship. God could have prevented Jonah from ever leaving his hometown and making it to the port of Joppa. He could have thrown a sandstorm up in front of his face. I've been in the Persian Gulf when you can see a giant sandstorm coming from the land out to sea. And it chokes everything. And you have to protect the ship's air systems. Wrap the, 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 all the air systems with cheesecloth as they cake over days with dust until the air clears. Chokes everything. God could have done that, but he didn't. He allowed them to go. These sailors were powerless to change their lives on their own power. They had no power at all. And Jonah pointed them rightly to God who what? Created the heavens and the earth. Jonah worshipped that God, though he didn't obey him very well, did he? He wasn't a very obedient prophet, I'd say. But even Jonah was learning the lesson that you can't run from God because there's nowhere that he's not. And so when we finally surrender our fight, and the glory of Christ is shown to us, and we are saved by God, just like the sailors, just like God saved them. They added nothing to their salvation except their own idolatry, That's the only thing they brought to the table was their own idolatry and their own futile efforts. The sailors worshipped God because God caused the storms in their life to cease. We are all going to go through storms in life and our ships are going to break apart. We need Christ and only Christ. They were dead men and now they were alive. They feared the Lord because of his power, his power over the sea and over their lives. And because they now knew that they were in the midst of a God's power who created all things in heaven on earth, and he was near to them. The unsaved don't generally fear God. They fear the situations around them. It says in verse 16 that they feared him exceedingly because of this. It wasn't just a little fear. They trembled in fear of him. This fear caused them to cry out to God, to offer sacrifices, to make vows to the Lord. Sometimes at the abortion mill, people will show up and we stop them before they even go into the the drive, the parking lot, and they're they're trembling. I go, why are you trembling? I'm I'm afraid. What are they afraid of? I don't know if this is the right thing to do. They're fearing the Lord. The Lord didn't require them to make sacrifices or vows, but they did it. This is all they knew how to do, and I want you to understand something. God hears the prayer of the faithful, of the fearful, of the brokenhearted, even when they offer up imperfect prayers. These guys weren't offering up some perfect prayer. This is all they knew how to do, and God received it. Cry out to God for your salvation. Your ship is breaking apart. You cannot save yourself any more than you caused your own birth. You're powerless, helpless, unable to do anything for yourself. Yet you were born. Now you must be born from above, according to Jesus. And only God can rescue you. Only God can rescue. And he only rescues through his son, Jesus Christ. 
Cry out to him today for your salvation. Don't wait another minute. Don't wait another day. If your ship is breaking apart, why would you wait another minute? Judgment is coming. Once your ship breaks apart and you enter the sea, you are indeed dead. And it is too late. Do not delay. Now, two weeks ago I preached on the salvation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> His atonement in John 3.14 as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. You see, our salvation comes from Christ upon the cross. Christ who atoned. Christ who paid the penalty for our sins. Do I need to explain it any further? To any child? To anyone watching online? Anybody present? I don't. Jonah told the doomed sailors of God who created the heavens and the earth, and they believed. With the sea calmed. I tell you, Jesus who was lifted on the cross, Jesus who created all things with his Father in heaven was upon the cross for us. God's Son died for your salvation. Cry out! I pray the lost here and the lost online cry out to him. I have no special prayer to lead you in. There is no such silly thing as the sinner's prayer. Cry out to him. The sailors cried out, God save us. And he did. Do you need more instruction? Cry out in the name of Jesus. That's it. And believe. Believe upon his name. Believe upon him and his power to save. Because he's the one who calls the storms. He's the one who calls things into existence by his own word. The sailors didn't believe him until the tempest quieted down. The wicked storm. A friend. We may not be facing a storm like the sailors were on the sea, but we do face the fierce wrath of God. And in this life, there are incredible storms that, that pollute our bodies and our minds. They were dying men. Before Christ, we were dying. The storm represents the power of sin to rule over us, and indeed it does. The power of sin causes all men to die. He kills all of us. And none are excluded. The fierce wrath of God is coming. How will you stand in the face of God's wrath? I've heard fools say I'd rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. Fools indeed who say such things because they don't know the Lord. No one will reign in hell except God Almighty who will forever crush the unrepentant under his wrath. There will be no end to the misery in hell. That is a storm unlike anything we could ever imagine, and it never ceases. If the sailors were doomed because of the tempest, how doomed must the damned fool be who comes under the wrath of God? To the lost I say, cry out for your salvation. Cry out. To the church I say, when you are saved, when he has saved you, live as a person who is saved. Why do we need to be taught the lesson of the sailors over and over again? In our complacency, we become self-reliant again and again, thinking that we need to row the ship, set our own course. That's folly for the Christian. Utter nonsense for the church. It's not for us. Church, trust in the Lord God. Our great God who called Jonah directs our very path. And that's good news for us because his directions are good. Surrender, dear church, again and again. And if you need to be reminded, do it again. Surrender to his will over and over. Begin your day surrendering to God in prayer. God, I need you this day. Strengthen me this day to do your will. Strengthen me that I might live a life that's holy, pleasing, and acceptable to you. May Christ be formed in us, in you. May you live dependent daily upon him, in his will and in his might. Amen.